so I'm going to uh, welcome you all to our webinar on medical cannabis. I'm Stephen Willett. I'm a GP, uh, clinical lead for substance misuse in Nottingham, and I'm chairing this webinar on behalf of SMM GP. Uh, the webinar has been made possible by an unrestricted grant from Althea, so thanks to them. I'd like to First, to advertise the SMMGP Premium Membership. Um, if you enjoy this webinar, there are 15 hours online CPD per year, mixture of webinars, research, uh, from as little as £50 per year. A bargain. Uh, so webinars coming up include image and performance enhancing drugs and chemsex. But uh, this webinar is the first of a series. This is more of an introduction to cannabis, but it's timely. Um, most of you all know that uh, 1st of November 18, so almost a year ago, the government made a landmark decision to resch reschedule cannabis uh, to Schedule 2. Uh, that's uh, allowing limited prescribing. But uh, not much has happened since then, and only a handful of patients have actually been prescribed it. So, what we're going to have tonight, uh, you're going to be get an overview of medical cannabis. I think you, you'll be somewhat bombarded by uh, an impressive uh, evidence base from, from Kishin. Um, you may have heard of a, of a range, well, a, a myriad of indications um, from treatment resistant epilepsy, chronic pain, uh, chemo related nausea, and many more. Uh, but you, you might be wondering, what is the evidence? We're going to be looking at pros and cons, uh, particularly from a clinical point of view. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing many of you uh, listening may, may have uh, concerns uh, about dependence or, or psychosis. Uh, well, well, we'll be looking at those. Um, and finally, perhaps most importantly for us in the UK, looking at treatment pathways. So whereas, as I've said, we only had a few prescribed it, um, in Canada, thousands, and we're going to see some of, um, of Kishin's evidence. So uh, delighted that our resource tonight is Dr. Kishin Mahabir, uh, a nephrologist by trade, but uh, more importantly tonight, medical director um, of Clinical Network Cannabis Clinics uh, in Canada. He's considered a key voice in the therapeutic uh, benefits of medical cannabis, not just in Canada, but internationally. What's going to happen is Kishan will talk for about 20 minutes, and then, um, <coughs> importantly, we'll have a Q&A following that, and you can get your questions in. Uh, webinar is being recorded, so you can watch again, and uh, we'll give you details on how to do that on an email. So put your questions or comments in the chat box on your screen, and um, I'll do my best to put those to Kishin. Um, there's um, lots of people watching, so uh, we're, we're up to 100 now. So whilst we hope to ask all your questions, apologies if we don't manage to tackle yours specifically. First, though, I've got a couple of questions for you. So, uh, Kate, could we have the first uh, question? For our audience, so I'll give you a few moments. It's just uh, just click a box or closest to it, okay? Uh, uh, if that's other, um, because it just be useful for us to know um, who's uh, who's listening in. Useful, interesting for you too. So last uh, few moments, okay? And there we are. Uh, yes, if we can have that answer. So we've got uh, certainly the most are uh, doctors, but a good chunk of nurses, pharmacists, um, key workers, some patients, great, uh, and some others. So that's great. Another question. Do you think, uh, yeah, let's have the question up, because we wanted to ask this um, at the beginning and, uh, and see what you think. What do you think to this question? Should medical cannabis should be more, more widely available in the UK? Just because you're here on this doesn't imply that uh, 
uh, that you do. Uh, but uh, let's see. Okay, so overwhelming percent of 82% yes, um, and some uh, reserving judgment within no. Thank you very much. So, enough of me. Time for the main course, uh, which is, is Kishin. We'll, we'll uh, turn our webcams off and um, so that you can see the slides better. Uh, so, Kishin on uh, medical cannabis in the UK. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you guys for inviting me here. So I am a nephrologist by training and self-taught medical cannabis expert, you know, also self-titled. Some patients ask me how I can be a medical cannabis expert, but after seeing close to 5,000 patients over the last five years, four to five years approximately, um, I've seen all the goods, the bads, and de developed a systematic approach to understanding the evidence, translating the evidence to my patients, and then... Uh, assessing my patients for indications, contraindications, and prescribing. So that's what I'm going to go through here today, right? I'm going to go through giving you guys tools on how to understand the evidence, how to assess patients, how to look at indications, contraindications, how to weigh the risk benefits, and how to consider prescribing to your patients, giving you kind of those tools um, to take with you uh, along to your own practice to understand where the benefits of medical cannabis may lie. So I'm going to framework by this uh, presentation by looking at the UK access to medical cannabis because everybody knows how hard it is in the UK to get medical cannabis. It's similar to where we were in Canada 10 to 15 years ago where there's a big void, right? And in, in, in the UK, it's a lot of it in the NHS and a lot of patients are turning to the private market because physicians are turning to the private market. Um, physicians who can prescribe are all specialists in the UK. Here in Canada, any physician can prescribe. You don't need any special license to. Right? But in the UK, it's any specialist can prescribe. And because of the private market's more financially incentivizing, a lot of uh, specialists move there, making it a higher cost for patients. So there's access issues there. And then when you look at amongst those specialists, you know, um, there a lot of them are misinformed because similar to Canada 10, 15 years ago, um, the guidelines that came out were negatively focused on mostly the side effects and the, the potential long-term adverse outcomes versus actually focusing on translating the evidence on the potential benefit. And so if you look at some of the NHS guidelines and some of the NICE guidelines, it focuses heavily on the negative impact of cannabis and the lack of evidence, which I'll show you that there is a lot of literature out there. Quality is questionable, but you can use a lot of the literature that's already out there and the volumes of it to translate to your patients. And like Canada 10 to 15 years ago, the costs for consultations and follow-ups in the private clinics are high, and the product is obtained internationally and dispensed to a pharmacy, so the pharmacy drive, the, drive up the costs per patient. So it's very important when, you're, when you as a practitioner are prescribing to a patient, or if you're the patient, understanding where the costs come from. Because we, I just did one patient in the UK um, uh, by co-managing them with one of the physicians there, and we initially thought the cost of the cannabis was going to be 100 pounds per bottle of oil. They priced it up 175 after the product finally came into the country. So when we're choosing cannabis, we have to be very careful uh, what we choose up front. It's very thought through because the cost of the patients for trial and error is very high. So this is a lot. There's a lot of void in the UK at the moment, but it's this void is starting to be filled as cannabis is becoming more available and more, and people become more aware of it and physicians are becoming more educated. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a little bit of the basics, but not focus a lot on the, on the background of the endocannabinoid system, but just to understand the endocannabinoid system, all of us have one in every part of our body. It's more active than more, most neurotransmission in, the, in our entire body, right? It's at the presynaptic and postsynaptic um, terminals of, the, of, of neurotransmission, as well as in, located in certain organs. So basically, the endocannabinoid system exists to regulate homeostasis, is to bring things back to normal. When we feel extreme pain or things go out of homeostasis, it's to try to normalize that. That's how I see it. When things need regulation, that's when endo our endocannabinoid system comes into play. Um, they're on the presynaptic membrane. There are receptors CB1 and CB2 receptors that bind to our endocannabinoids, 2AG and 
uh, anandamide, AEA, and that's our endocannabinoids, but also uh, THC, which is coming from the cannabis plant itself, and synthet synthetic can cannabinoids like trobanolol and nabilone also bind this receptor and help regulate uh, neurotransmission. But to keep it simple, this is all for homeostasis. The difference between synthetic cannabis and uh, cannabis coming, uh, endocannabinoids, co or sorry, cannabinoids coming from the plant itself is that there are 500 other distinct compounds within the cannabis uh, plant that, act, that actually play a role in what's called the entourage effect. They play a role in modulating THC's effect on the presynaptic uh, terminal and uh, modulate some of the other perception or some of the other effects within the body itself to promote sedation, to promote, uh, promote anti-inflammation, to promote uh, uh, an anxiolytic effect, uh, etc. So you can have different combinations. And we're going to talk about some of these other chemicals later because some of the companies, when you look at what's available uh, for cannabis and THC predominant strains, are labeling some of the other terpenes um, that may actually affect the sedating effect of THC. And we'll go, we're going to go through that in more detail later. So this entourage effect is very important because it goes above and beyond uh, what the synthetic uh, cannabinoids can provide um, for both good and for both and for potential side effects as well. Okay, the CB1 receptors are located mainly in the nervous system, and the CB2 receptors are located mainly peripherally in the immune system. But we have CB1 and CB2 receptors in multiple organs all over the body, and I'm giving a talk next week on the effects of uh, cannabis uh, and the kidneys in terms of um, any adverse effects or beneficial effects and, and or kidney progression. Um, so these, this is good to know because any part of our body has the potential to be affected by our endocannabinoids or exogenous cannabinoids like the THC, CBD, or others um, and promote either the positive effects or potential side effects. So understanding the evidence. Um, what I'm going to give you is kind of an insight to how you approach the evidence because I was self-taught how to look the evidence up, how to translate to my patients. So I did a PubMed search this morning before the presentation. If you look at medical cannabis, there's 7,500 articles on PubMed recognized uh, for medical cannabis. And if you type in cannabis alone, there's close to uh, 20,000 articles. So it's not devoid of um, evidence. It's not devoid of uh, research dedicated toward cannabis. But some of the quality of the research that's put out there is still a little bit in question but it can be translated to the patient in front of you. Okay. Looking at chronic pain as being the most common reason why people um, seek out medical cannabis, um, the points I want to make out here, and you can read the slide in front of you, is that most of our understanding about cannabinoids um, modulating pain was derived from the synthetic cannabinoids. Sativex, available in the UK as well as in Canada, is uh, a plant-derived one-to-one mix of CBD and THC called nabiximol. So it doesn't include all the other uh, phytocannabinoids or um, other chemicals in the, in the cannabis plant. It, it, it includes just CBD and THC in equal amounts. Trobanolol and labolone are uh, THC analogs, so they most, they most likely mimic THC in its effect on the body. But a lot of our evidence comes from those, and, and there's some evidence from the dried cannabis uh, showing good responses in neuropathic pain, uh, fibromyalgia, more so than uh, non-neuropathic pain. So that's the second point. When you're looking at cr uh, chronic pain, you'll see a larger benefit um, in cannabis as well as the synthetic cannabinoids um, in the neuropathic pain population. That being said is a majority of my patient population has non-neuropathic pain. They have general non-cancer uh, no susceptive pain, and they do derive benefit, but not to the same extent that my neuropathic patients do. Um, what they do improve in is uh, quality of life and sleep, and a lot of the mental health scores actually improve better. So the ang their anxiousness and depressions improve uh, more so than the pain itself. So when you're approaching the evidence for cannabis for whatever indication, um, you have to look at these four categories. You have to look at the what's the evidence for synthetic uh, cannabinoids, what's the evidence for 
the actual dry cannabis itself. And within the dry cannabis, there's a lot of the preclinical studies as well as clinical studies. And take that information and apply it to the patient in front of you. So those are the kind of four different areas to look at when looking at the evidence. And when it comes to pain, there is a lot of evidence looking at pain and cannabis and a lot of benefit, especially in the neuropathic pain population. And just to go through one recent trial in, the, in Germany, which was done with Nabixamol, which is the one-to-one -one plant derived CBD to THC. They looked at 800 patients uh, and divide these patients up into nociceptive pain, mixed pain, neuropathic pain um, over a 12-week period. And they, lo they looked at what was their improvement on multiple subjective um, validated scoring scales, as well as what was their um, uh, di discontinuation rate of various tr um, pain medications they were on from the beginning to the end of that 12-week period. So if you look here, uh, you can see improvements across multiple scales in uh, uh, pain, sleep, quality of life, um, anxiety, and depression. And if you, if you compare the nociceptive pain, which is in the, in the uh, light gray boxes, compared to the mixed pain, compared to those with neuropathic pain, um, the neuropathic pains improved a lot more across the board, which is in keeping with what we see anecdotally um, at, the, at the bedside when prescribed to patients. And if you look at how many patients have a 30% versus 50% versus 70% improvement in pain, 80% uh, of people had 30% or more improvement. 67% uh, uh, of patients had a 50% improvement in pain, and almost 43% of patients had a greater 70% improvement in pain. So there is benefits to cannabis. And again, a lot of the, ev the evidence here is still derived from, a, from the synthetic cannabis. And if you look at the, the analgesic medication taken for maintenance therapy, uh, in the neuropathic pain, they had 20 to 30% decrease in um, strong opiate analgesics, uh, as well as a 10 to 20% decrease in anticonvulsants, antidepressants, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and other non-opiate analgesics like paracetamol or Tylenol. Okay, so they did have a significant decrease, especially in the neuropathic population, not as much in the nociceptive pain or the chronic non-cancer uh, pain, and in the mixed pain where you couldn't uh, differentiate if the patient had a true uh, uh, neuropathic component, they still had some decrease in uses, especially in the strong opioid category. And if you look at acute analgesic rescue medication, followed a similar trend. A lot of these patients uh, required less and less rescue breakthrough pain medication use. Okay, so these are important things because for, from a patient perspective, they reached the goals of pain control and uh, reached the goal of decreasing other potentially harmful medications. Because from a risk benefit side point of view, the opiate analgesics are higher risk than actually using cannabis itself. Okay, from a Canadian perspective, over the last, since 2012, um, in a veterans population, as cannabis prescribing went up in that veterans population, you'll see the decrease in use of opiates and benzodiazepines. And we know in this population, especially the elderly population, benzodiazepines increase risk of falls significantly. So they, um, in this study, they didn't look at adverse outcomes, but they look at decreased use of um, more harmful options and medications of benzodiazepines and opiates as cannabis prescri prescribing increased over time which is very, very, very cool to see. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you my approach to patients, okay? Because uh, you, when you look at evidence for dried cannabis, right, the, a, lot, a lot of the times the populations are very small, um, the outcomes are very subjective. So I take kind of three points, and every time I see a patient, I consider that patient a trial of one. I look at the patient for indications, what are they coming for? The primary reason, secondary reason? What are the potential contraindications? And there's no actually uh, absolute contraindication except for pregnancy and breastfeeding at this point in time. Other contraindications may be um, active heart disease um, because of the uh, sympathetic overdrive from THC. Um, other co contraindications may be um, active psychosis, but in pa we, we are using cannabis in patients who do have psychosis. Uh, co-managing with their psychiatrist here in Canada. All right, so there's not a lot of contraindications, but
But when you go through, when you when you're seeing a patient, I just I like to outline the indication, the contraindications, and and talk to the patient about risks and benefits. Then I then I set goals with patients. All right, we prescribe follow up, and then we continue to adjust over time. And every patient's an N of one trial because whatever works for one patient tends not always to work for another patient over time. And we'll talk to you guys about how to choose um, a CBD predominant or THC predominant strain for a patient. But when I'm considering cannabis overall, you know, I, I look at three things. Is the evidence for the conventional therapy weak? Is the evidence for cannabis um, um, stronger than any conventional therapy at this point in time? And if there is a risk for cannabis less than that for conventional therapy? Once the patient fulfills these three criteria, as well as they have an indication and they don't have any contraindication, then I kind of I move to the next step of setting goals and consider prescribing for the patients. And if you look at Canada in, uh, in terms of where we consider cannabis along the treatment algorithms for pain, um, it's there alongside opiates. It's not after they consider opiates, we consider cannabis, we consider it at the same level. And it's not a formal uh, policy, but mo uh, most physicians are, have evolved their thought process to consider cannabis at the same time they're considering opiates. And this is just a case um, that we're going to go through. So 47-year-old male post motor vehicle accidents with chronic traumatic pain in cervical spine with no neuropathic component. He has anxiety and insomnia with a medical history of diabetes, heart attack with a previous uh, stent in place, hypertension and dyslipidemia. His current medication include Tramacet, which is an opiate, lorazepam, bisoprol, ramipril, torvastatin, aspirin. Uh, he's on disability, so he's not working at the moment. His, pa his past therapy for the pain included paracetamol, naproxen, anti-inflammatory, nicotine, physiotherapy, chiropractor, massage therapy. And for insomnia, the past therapy included mel melatonin, trazodone, zopiclone. And for anxiety, he used counseling. So I'm looking at, you know, what are the indications? So for him, his primary condition is pain. His secondary conditions are insomnia. And he has a tertiary condition of anxiety and depression. His age is over 25, and that age is a gray area because in Canada, recreationally, you can buy cannabis as of 18 years old. The thought that cannabis promotes uh, schizophrenia in, in people young, uh, younger than the age of 25 is being heavily debated, debated here in Canada, and the correlation doesn't really exist. Those who do get psychosis on cannabis um, and, or those who do get schizophrenia on cannabis have other environmental and genetic predispositions to schizophrenia. Cannabis is not the direct cause. And out of 5,000 patients, I only had two psychotic episodes, one who actually took an entire bottle of THC in one go, and the other patient who had underlying uh, psychoactive tendencies that took uh, a significant amount of THC too. So it's, it's quite, quite, quite safe. In this patient, there's no contraindications because they don't actually have active heart disease at this point in time. And what I do when I'm looking at the risk benefits in terms of conventional therapy for the indications the patient came in with, I'll see what they fail. So the patient failed multiple therapies for pain, multiple therapies for insomnia, but hasn't tried anything for anxiety. So in this case, in this case uh, my indications are mainly in the insomnia and chronic pain, and anxiety will be helped with the cannabis itself, but it's not an upfront indication because they haven't failed other conventional therapies. And again, there's no number of conventional therapies uh, that you have to fail before you consider cannabis. You can consider it in mul at multiple points along the treatment algorithm, unless there's policy set up in the country you're practicing. And the goals of the patient was to reduce the background pain during the night, reduce episodes of acute pain, getting to sleep and staying asleep, and then decreasing and stopping tramacin and lorazepam. And every patient I outline these goals, right? And we review these goals each time. So I either titrate the medication or adjust accordingly or change the strain. So how do we choose a strain? And in the UK, the requirement is um, three things. In Canada, all we have to do is, is prescribe a dose. We don't have to actually tell them what to buy. Prescribe a dose and we recommend uh, a profile of CBD and THC. So in the UK, you have to actually tell them what is the THC profile, what is the CBD profile, what's the modality, are they inhaling it, ingesting it, and what is the actual right dose. So how do you choose the right strain profile? So when you look at cannabis, it's 500 distinct compounds, like we said before, but the two main ones are CBD and THC. And what you have available in the UK and in Canada and in the US 
are cannabis, that's, that's THC predominant, CBD predominant, or a combination of those two in various ratios. They don't really, really label some of the other phytocannabinoids, but they're starting to label some of the terpenes, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, some patients may come up to you and tell you that they want sativa versus indica. Um, that is a very subjective and patient-reported feeling that they get when taking cannabis. The sativa uh, um, strain and indica strains don't exactly exist anymore because a lot of the cannabis has been crossbred um, over time. So these species don't exist in um, licensed produced uh, areas in Canada. They don't exist in dispensaries. They don't exist on the black market because over years um, they've been crossbred and crossbred again to obtain new and new species. Um, and new and new profiles of THC and CBD that the exact uh, species don't exist independently. So we, what you'll see online is, is things labeled as a sativa and indica. They're not tr true sativas or indicas. They're just labeled that based on some of the other chemicals in the cannabis, some of the other terpenes that may modify the THC, right, to make it more uplifting versus more sedating. And I'll talk about what those, what, which terpenes actually do that. So this is not a valid scientifically. We do not classify things like this. Patients will ask you, right? Uh, and companies uh, providing cannabis are moving away from this classification. So again, it's focusing mainly on CBD versus THC uh, uh, profile and, 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 and when in choosing the right strain. The terpenes are secondary profiles that are uh, secondary chemicals that influence CBD and THC. Um, uh, they're the actual chemicals that give the cannabis its smell. Uh, when combined with THC and CBD, it can produce some mild altering effects. So a limonene or myrosine can have opposite effects. So in Canada, I had one patient taking a THC high, uh, sorry, a THC predominant strain at nighttime. And there, from this company, there's two THC predominant strain. One had limonene, one had myrosine. We recommended the myrosine strain. The patient took the limonene strain at nighttime and actually kept the patient up all night long without any sedation. We switched them over to the same concentration THC but combined predominantly with myrosine and the patient slept. So they, it did have actual uh, altering effect on the THC itself. So when you, when you see things online that says a sativa versus indica, they're not true sativas or indicas. They may be reflection of the... Uh, terpene profile that makes the THC more or less sedating. Uh, when it comes to CBD, the effects of these terpenes is less well understood, and most of them are labeled alongside the THC. And this is the next tool in classification of cannabis. Um, these are examples of predominant strains. So you have a CBD predominant strain, 20 to 25 milligrams per mil, a THC predominant strain, 20 to 25 milligrams per mil, and then a, a, somewhere in between two to one mix and one-to-one -one mix. What's key here is that, yes, they may have a slightly different concentrations. At the end of the day, you can achieve the same amount of THC and CBD if you adjust the amount of milliliters you take in. And that's key for patients because a lot of these companies market higher concentrations and lower concentrations at different prices to get the patient to pay more. So whatever their needs are, um, you have to get, get, get the patient to buy the right concentration. So they uh, are not spending a significant amount of money, okay? And when it comes to choosing a CBD versus THC predominant strain, um, there's no guidelines on what to do, right? There's no, I, I put up this slide based on how I approach patients, and I approach patients mainly from a um, minimalized risk perspective. CBD tends to have lower risk of any side effects, lower risk of um, psychoactivity than THC. So in those patients who have higher risk of psychoactivity, those with already mood disorders, anxiety, depression, PTSD, OCD, even in Alzheimer's patients, I may start with a CBD predominant strain. And in those pa uh, and there are other uh, conditions like seizures where CBD has been heavily studied. So in those cases, I use CBD predominant strains. Whereas THC has been studied more so uh, in tremors, Tourette syndrome, insomnia because it's more sedating, in um, chronic pain, which I'll talk about more in a second, uh, as well as appetite stimulation and chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. So if you look at those conditions, they actually benefit more from THC. 
And when it comes to pain, you could use the whole spectrum. So it all depends on patient preference. It depends on what other comorbidities you have. If the patient came in with uh, pain and sleep and they wanted a strain for nighttime, I may use a THC-based strain. If the patient wanted pain and they had anxiety and depression in the background, they wanted pain control during the day, I may, to, may stick, try a CBD-predominant uh, strain, right? But there is a nuance to that because when you actually look at all the evidence for pain and cannabis, all the studies of actual dry cannabis derived from the plant were done in THC. So some of the physicians in the US, some of the physicians here in Canada, believe that the CBD itself is not the actual um, compound that treats the pain. Even though CBD has been labeled to have analgesic effects, and labeled to have anti-inflammatory effects, um, some physicians believe it's, it doesn't actually influence uh, the pain at the levels available in, in these bottles. Because when you look at the trials for seizures, look at the trials for anxiety, where CBD has more studies of, um, they were using 2,500 milligrams of CBD per dose, pure CBD per dose, without any other of the chemicals from the cannabis plant. When you look at a 25 to 25 milligrams per mil at a 50 mil bottle, you have to be using 100 mils to get those doses. That's two bottles at 100 to 200 pounds per bottle. They cannot, patients cannot achieve these, bottle, these doses per day. And plus, when they did some other studies, He's looking at bioavailability. Bioavailability in the oil form compared to the inhalation form is a little bit less. When you look at specific bio bioavailability of CBD versus THC, THC is highly bioavailable, whereas CBD is not. And they did some concentration studies of CBD in the system after ingestion, and they could not find any traces of CBD in the blood after ingestion of the oil. So some people think, you know, when you look at a CBD predominant strain, it's 20 milligrams to 25 milligrams of CBD per mil, and there's still one milligram of THC. It's not devoid of THC. So some physicians think, is it that small amount of THC when combined with the CBD that actually has the beneficial effect, or is it the CBD alone? I'm on the fence for this, right? But I've had patients where we tried CBD first because they had other comorbidities where, you know, there may be a slight increased risk of the psychoactivity of THC, because they may have had anxiety um, or it was patient preference, and we transitioned them over to THC later because they failed, they failed uh, uh, benefit on, on CBD. And we're going to talk about how to dose it in a second. Okay, so these are the things to, to consider uh, when you're choosing a CBD versus predominant versus THC predominant strain. Okay, in the UK, the only method of consumption is oral. Uh, vaporization is not available, smoking is not available, and the difference is when you smoke or vaporize, it takes about five minutes to work and lasts only one to two hours. When you ingest it, it takes about an hour to work, maybe up to 90 minutes, it lasts six to eight hours. So in Canada, we have the availability of both. We use it slightly differently. We use the oral ingestion form as their chronic background pain control or uh, control of whatever uh, indication they're coming in with. And for acute breakthrough, we use the vaporization or the smoking. And here, because I'm a physician, I only recommend vaporization. And when you look at the amount that you're supposed to prescribe, so now you have the CBD and THC profile. Now you have the um, mode of in, uh, intaking the cannabis. And now we look at what is the proper amount. So when you look at a self-reported um, study, international study, um, of over 6,000 patients, there was an average of three grams of day of self-medicated use. This is across the world. When you look at the Canadian uh, medical regulations, they have an average prescription of two to two and a half grams per day of, of, of cannabis. Um, and when you look at naive patients, it's a lot lower, 1.2 grams per day. So this is not as scary as we think. This is not, you know, knowing the patients who self-medicate 10, five or 10 grams per day. A lot of the, like majority, 90 to 95 percent of patients use between one and two grams per day uh, as their prescription. What this e equals in terms of the uh, the bottles of oil that's available in the UK. So each bottle of oil could be between five, could be labeled as five grams per bottle or 10 grams per bottle. It doesn't tell you what the concentration of CBD and THC is. That's labeled on the bottle. That's independent. So one. A gram a day is 30 grams per month, which equals to three bottles of oil if the bottle if the bottle of oil is 10 grams per bottle. And that's what the patient's able to order. 
and you have to be very specific in the UK because if you write a prescription um, for a patient uh, that allows them to get one to one and a half bottles, if they pay, if they have to pay for anything more than one bottle, if they pay for a full second bottle itself, they can't get a little bit more. So when you're when you're writing prescriptions for patients, you have to be exactly um, on the amount that equals one bottle of cannabis because any more on the prescription, if they have 1.2 bottles equivalent based on your prescription, they'll have to pay for two full ones. So that's, you know, the extra 100 to 200 pounds per that extra bottle. So it has to be very, very specific. Whereas here they can dispense it out a, a little bit easier. Okay. Um, so that's the conversion rate of the, the actual prescribing amount and the actual amount of bottles the patient can can uh, receive during that month prescription. And in the UK, you, you have to do the prescription every 28 days. Here we can do it three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. Uh, when you're doing a titration, because it's a milliliter amount, all the bottles have syringes. We titrate up starting at either 0.5 milliliters or 0.2 milliliters and slowly go up every day to achieve their goal. Um, and this is, a, this is a general titration protocol based on um, a licensed producer here in Canada. And people can have their own. I have more rapid titrations, slower titrations, depending if the patient's naive, not naive. But these things can be done easier. And as you get more comfortable in prescribing, you can figure out your own way to, to titrate. And when it looks at when you're looking at maximum doses, um, there's no real maximum dose for CBD because they use 2,500 milligrams of pure CBD in the trials, which is not realistic in achieving based on the amount of CBD found in the cannabis oil bottles itself. But for most indications, if we start off at five to 20 milligrams per day in divided doses, because it lasts six to eight hours, I do it three to four times a day, depending what the patient can afford, depending what they take and depending how often they need it, right? And I go up to a dose of 60 milligrams as my threshold per dose. And the reason why I do this is that equals approximately two to two and a half milliliters per dose, because after that, I, in, my, in the back of my mind, I think it's financially not feasible for the patient to use that much cannabis because how much it costs. And that threshold can be different for anybody, um, but that's my threshold before I switch them over to uh, a THC-based strain because of financially, financial feasibility. Um, it may, some patients may be able to afford more, and we push it up even more, but uh, to get them to, to 300, 400 milligrams, two things will happen. The amount of THC will be so high that they have side effects because it's still one milligram of THC for 20 milligrams of CBD, or it's financially not feasible. So, but the key here is no, there's no upper limit to CBD. Whereas in THC, 20 milligrams to 30 milligrams to 40 milligrams, that's when the, the psychotropic effects start to come in. So when you're starting small and only one to two, two milligrams of THC is all you need to get an effect, we start small and slowly go up. So a lot of my patients are using only up to 10, maybe up to 20 milligrams of THC per dose, right? And they're using a, some, some of them are using as small as one milligram and coming off their opiates to, to achieve their effects. Some are using one to two milligrams to get great sleep effects, one to two milligrams to get great appetite stimulation um, uh, with the THC itself. So, um, Kishan, can I just um, jump in? Um, this is this is absolutely fascinating. We, but uh, um, I didn't want you to run out of time for questions. Um, if the, the and, and I don't want you to miss the American experience bit. So, if you could maybe jump to that, that would be great. For sure. I mean, the last it is only two more slides left here, right? So, in the UK, it's up every twenty-eight days. And every 28 days when I see the patient, I classify the patient based on harms and benefits. Uh, and I, you, can, you can take a picture of this slide, but this determines whether I change the strain or up titrate based on the harm and the benefit of the patient. And then the drug interactions, right? Drug interactions is the biggest thing people hear about when it comes to cannabis. THC has very minimal drug interaction. CBD interacts with its sip. 3A4 pathway where 75% of all medications interact with, but its interaction is, is theoretical and it also very minimal. And if you look at any studies looking at drug interaction with CBD, the amount of CBD used in the trials for drug interactions were significantly higher than what you can ever achieve or give to a patient um, at the bedside. So there's very low drug interaction with THC and CBD. 
And I'm going to go through an American experience because we have 35 clinics in the U.S. Um, right now doing about 100,000 patients per year. Uh, we acquired these clinics, so it's our own clinics. We, we can drive how they do, and we can collect data on an ongoing basis in the way we want to. But just to show you the benefit to risk ratio on the two boxes in the middle, you'll see the positive. We, we did a study on 18,000 patients all coming for all conditions. This is just a screenshot of a dashboard of the data we're just generating day by day. And you see the amount of pain reduction, improved sleep, stress, anxiety, mood, um, compared to those with side effects. And then most negative effect is dry mouth. When you look at paranoia or psychosis, very few patients experience. Only 500 patients experience paranoia, and very like next to no patients experience true psychosis uh, in this in this 18,000 patient population. And most of the strains in the in the in the U.S. are THC based. There's very few strains that are CBD based either because of availability or because the physicians there believe more in the benefits of THC than they do in CBD. So this is very key here um, uh, on this slide itself. And when you look at it, we just did a pilot of 119 patients with pain, right? Uh, we, uh, the, we did a, a scoring on PHQ-9, which is a quality of life anxiety depression scale, and their scores improved by 50% in these patients just off of first three month uh, follow-up. Um, we're going to publish data on a bunch of different scoring scales in the next uh, three to six months for uh, close to 30,000 patients looking at a brief pain index, BPI score, uh, quality of life score, SF12, um, anxiety depression score, and um, um, there's one other score that I'm blank off the top of my head, but we're going to publish this, and oh, sorry, just overall subjective feelings of improvement and or side effects. Okay, so we're going to publish this over time. And if you look at the, the common side effects, a lot of them are dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, a little bit of dizziness. THC has more sympathetic overdrive, so you can see a little bit of uh, tachycardia palpitations. In very rare cases, do that, does that tachycardia lead to demand ischemia and potential of heart attack? Uh, when they did studies, they looked at less than 1% of patients who took uh, THC chronically um, had um, an actual um, myocardial infarction or cardiac event. So it's very, very low risk, but that's why I consider it in part of the relative contraindications that they do have active cardiac disease, I may stick towards the CBD. So CBD-based therapies don't generally have these side effects. They don't have the, um, the drowsiness, the dry eyes, dry mouth. Um, the memory changes, the uh, palpitations, chest pains, or the uh, orthostatic symptoms of dizziness when they stand, people stand up quickly. THC has a little bit more of those, but it's still extremely rare compared to the actual benefit itself. And you can see the proportions of side effects compared to the benefits there. All right. Thank you, guys. Kishan, um, well done. Um, that was was um, a fantastic tour through the, um, the whole subject and um, I'm, we've already got some questions but now that people have, uh, um, you finish your presentation I'm sure there'll be more coming so um, keep them coming folks. Um, one just while I'm um, uh, looking at those, Kishan could you um, give us some idea of what actual experience you've had in the UK of prescribing and as part of your answer perhaps um, um, you could just disclose any interests uh, that you might have too. That would be great. Perfect. So um, I do a lot of uh, co-management of three patients in the UK. So we have uh, clinics opening in the UK, partnering up, um, providing them the software to run these clinics efficiently and to collect the data similar to what we showed in the American experience. We're running a pilot study of 20,000 patients through these clinics called the My Access Clinics in London, mainly based out of London, but uh, located in small, smaller cities outside of London as well. And my experience in the UK is that it takes a long time to go from point A to point D, and it's quite expensive for the patient at this point in time because there's no competition. So patients, number one, need a referral to a specialist. Some of the uh, primary care physicians uh, may not understand cannabis 
may not want to deal with it, may not want to open up their practice to say that they're sending referrals for cannabis because they don't want patients to flood in, you know, certain backgrounds to, to, to go. So there's that limitation. Once they get to the specialist side, a prescription needs to be filled and it has to be sent to quality care review. That takes time. We're, we're, we're navigating that system so it's becoming more efficient. And then we have to get an approval and then we have to send it to a pharmacy and then that pharmacy has to get the product in from outside the country, which with, with which availability is still an issue in terms of uh, uh, actual cannabis in itself. And then once that's done, the pharmacy yep. determines the price. So there is a lot of issues in terms of, of access and cost to the patients. And that's my experience so far. Um, that being said is, um, now that a bunch of clinics are opening up, it's going to drive the cost of these consultations to the private side down. Now that these pilot studies are being done, in, uh, there may be more responsibility on the NHS to take a more active role in uh, providing uh, actual physicians to prescribe cannabis. Uh, yeah. And availability actually will come through the pipeline. So we have, in our system, we have 100 patients uh, ready to go, just awaiting some of the uh, uh, approvals. Yes, and maybe if the legalization uh, agenda politically changes, then, then that will make it a whole lot easier. Um, yeah. I've got some comments here that, that otherwise people will uh, perhaps just go and uh, um, buy it themselves uh, in an unregulated way. Yes. Uh, so what I get right. to talk about is when, if legal, when legalization happened in Canada for the recreational side, um, it actually drove up the medical market and drove down the costs. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it, it, more patients because of um, stereotypes behind cannabis, more pa patients who were never considering cannabis went to the cannabis side. A lot of older patients, my patient population went, or demographics went from 30 years old to 70 years old on average after legalization, and the costs went down exponentially. Okay. Uh, right, I'm going to do some, some quicker fire questions so that we can try and get through some of these. One of them um, comes into your talk. Um, the, it's the old chestnut about um, uh, psychosis risk. I, I think we all heard you say that you actually even, far from it being a contraindication, you actually uh, use it as part of the treatment for uh, psychosis, no doubt with care, but but is there not a, a, a bit of a risk for someone with mental mental illness already? Yes, so there is a risk to somebody with mental illness, uh, whether it's psychotic mental illness or not, having the psychotic effects of cannabis. The risk is extremely low, right? You need very high doses of THC, yeah. and if you take a yeah. CBD predominant uh, approach, yeah. the risk is extremely low, there's that aspect of it. And also the amount of THC we use uh, in microdosing, so you start off very slow and titrate up, um, or it's not the amount of THC we see in, this, in, the, in the patients getting psychosis. And also, when you look at the studies of those who got psychosis in the recreational market, um, or these observational, large-scale observational trials, a lot of the cannabis were unregulated. A lot of them were, uh, may potentially have been, or noted to be um, cut with other things like K2 or spice, that were those things were actually contributing to the psychotic episodes, not the cannabis itself. Yeah, um, excellent. Um, got a question. Here's an interesting one. Um, a paper um, about uh, nabiximols for cannabis withdrawal. Um, yes. Uh, any care to comment? Um, there's actually a few papers. I don't know which one you're, you're going to talk about. There's a few papers of uh, the, the big small and cannabis. You're talking about withdrawal, right? Yeah, but it's 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 uh, we can't go into the detail. But the the question is around: Can it be you? Can the big smalls be used for cannab cannabis withdrawal? Uh, it can be used for cannabis withdrawal. Um, I've well, not used it uh, for. What are the big <laughs> Oh yeah, so let me define that. So nabiximols, I know it's, it was a little part of my presentation, it's Sativex. It's uh, yeah. used in the UK, it's available for, uh, it's quite, quite expensive. It's available here, it's quite a way expensive. 
So, and the risk of actual withdrawal is so low in cannabis at the doses we're looking at here that um, we, I've never had to use it for any patients when we're stopping cannabis or the patient stopped on their own. And you okay. don't need to down cannabis. So, you know, there is evidence to say that you can use it, but because of the cost and because of the risk of withdrawal is low, because the risk of dependence is low, then you don't need to consider it. And the only, the, the actual withdrawal symptoms only last uh, 40, usually around 48 hours, and they're very minor symptoms. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. Um, got a question here, uh, a clinical question. My patient has an advanced neuroendocrine tumor, um, an opiate-based uh, analgesics not very effective. Um, so could he benefit from uh, some medical uh, cannabis? Can you, can you state the first part again and cut out for a second? Um, he had a, a new, uh, the patient has a neuroendocrine tumor and yep. um, opioids have not been very helpful. Uh, yes, so cannabis can definitely be used in this instant. Um, uh, the, the two or three patients that we got cannabis in, in uh, you approved in the UK were for malignancy related uh, pain. So it all depends on the indication. If it's for appetite stimulation versus pain versus nausea, um, you can tailor the, the treatment accordingly. For pain, you could use a CBD or THC predominant strain. Um, for the nausea associated with chemotherapy, you can use a THC predominant and same with the appetite stimulation. Great. Uh, right. What, um, here's a bit of a crunchy one. What, um, uh, why have NICE rejected the use of medical cannabis? <laughs> so it's a lot of it, and I, I can't comment on it specifically. Um, we're reviewing the reasons why NICE it has rejected it. So we can come up with a plan to tackle that with our pilot project and then tailor project pro pilot project to present to NICE to say that, you know, there is benefit. Um, I think it has to do, or it has to do with the paucity of good quality evidence, the focus on negative outcomes, and there may be some lobbying behind the scenes. But it, but the big thing is the uh, focus on negative outcomes and the paucity of good quality evidence. Even though I think there's a lot of actual good quality evidence um, out there available uh, for us to translate to our patients. So it's based on that, and they don't have a lot of UK specific data when it comes to cannabis. Most of it is uh, driven by Israel, the US, Canada, uh, and the Netherlands, and various other places around Europe. Okay. Um, here's, here's an interesting uh, question. Should all recreational use be considered medical? Okay. So all recreation use, that's a, that's a very loaded question. Um, I don't consider recreational use medical if patients are self-medicating. I mean, that's maybe, that may be a personal approach to this because they, it, it, it doesn't go through the same rigor. Um, it, it also depends where they're getting it from. We can't uh, qualify that actual cannabis is standardized uh, over time as, all, as well as what are the other chemicals within the cannabis plant itself as well as dosing. Um, that being said is the, the actual cannabis available medically and recreationally here in Canada are the, is the same cannabis. There's no difference. People equate CBD as medical and THC as recreational. It doesn't exist because most of the actual medical evidence comes from THC and that's what's actually being used in the same actual amounts for the most part uh, recreationally and, and from legal or illegal sources. So I don't consider self-medicating medical. Um, I consider self-medicating not going through the same rigors and I think those patients can do well and better on um, uh, some insight to what they're taking, how much they're taking, what's their actual dose and can we minimize that to get the same effect, right? With minim in, 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 effectively minimizing their exposure to high doses of THC um, over time. So I think those patients will benefit from actually being reviewed by a medical practitioner. Okay, uh, right. We are getting towards our last uh, question or, or two. Um, if I can maybe amalgamate a couple um, and put a little bit of my spin on it as well. What, what would you say, just going back to basics, what, what is the, 
the maximum bang for your buck in terms of medical cannabis? Which, which of those indications have the strongest evidence, would you say? Perfect. So we look at what's called low-hanging fruit for our studies. Chronic pain, neuropathic pain out of that is probably the low-hanging fruit. Um, and so pain in general, 70% of patients come in, neuropathic pain being the biggest bang for your buck. And then the other ones that have good uh, evidence for and probably good benefit is quality of life in anxiety, um, sleep, as well as chemotherapy-induced nausea and appetite stimulation. Okay, so the chemotherapy-induced nausea is an interesting one because when you look at comparisons to conventional therapies um, and conventional regimens, a lot of them decrease vomiting episodes, but not a lot of them decrease the actual feelings of nausea, whereas cannabis actually decreases the sensation of nausea. But it hasn't been shown to be superior to those in, in very aggressive chemotherapy regimens to reduce the vomiting aspect. So it's used uh, in uh, adjunct to their other, re their other regimens, not used to replace them. But those are the kind of areas that have the highest evidence and the biggest bang for your buck. And, and the other big area I take separately is fibromyalgia. A lot of my patients with fibromyalgia improve more so than every other patient because, it, because of, in fibromyalgia they have true pain, but there also is a tied in perception of their pain that exaggerates some of the pain and cannabis influences uh, the, neuro, the, ner the, uh, the neurologic pathways um, as well as the emotional pathways that may be tied in to that pain and changes the patient's perception of the pain. So my, my fibromyalgia patients improve more than anybody else. Uh, great. Um, now, um, what I think we'll do now, you, Kishan, you, you've been fantastic and, and answered these questions really, really well. Um, let's just see what, um, I suppose, a, a small poll to see what the, um, if, if we could have that uh, question again, um, Kate, of, uh, what do you think? Uh, should medical cannabis be more widely available in the UK? Um, so just uh, if you can answer that now. Well, um, you have done some power of convincing there. That, that has gone up from uh, 82 to 91 percent. So um, uh, you, you have answered a lot of questions there. Um, I've got one, before I just wrap up, I've just got one last uh, question, uh, links into a comment from someone. I, I won't uh, do someone not very impressed with cannabis being a, a plant rather than a medicine. I, I mean, look, uh, where did penicillin come from? Um, but um, what I will ask is, uh, there's a question around where do you think this is going in, in the UK? Um, you know, we've been a, almost a year without uh, much progress. What, what do you think is going to happen in this next year? I think what's going to happen is there are a lot of companies in the private sector that's going to force the public sector to really take a look at this, uh, NHS specifically, but there's a lot of clinics opening up very rapidly uh, in the private sector, attracting a lot of physicians and specialties, so chronic pain being the biggest, and mental health um, to these clinics because it's financially incentivizing for them. And I think the access to it will start improving. We took It took us 10 years. It's going to take you guys one third or even less time to achieve what we achieved in 10 years. We were where you were 10 years ago, but it took us 10 years to get to where we are now. And you guys will get there a lot faster. So as these clinics rapidly open up, because it's a business opportunity, it'll drive the costs down. And because the costs go down, access for patients will become more available from the private side. And as they see this, uh, the benefit, um, the public sec the public side will actually uh, take notice too. Um, so with that being said is there are a lot of companies in the UK right now looking at research, looking at influencing um, the NICE guidelines, uh, one's drug science specifically, and they're running all these pilot studies, 20 to 30,000 patients, and if you get part of these studies, you can get your cannabis at a, a lower cost too. So it's, it's things to consider what's available out there. And you guys are going to evolve quite quickly. Much, uh, um, very much a moving field, isn't it? Um, look, um, thank you. Now, um, audience, this was um, purposefully uh, uh, an introduction. I know you've been hit with, uh, with an awful lot of, of, uh, of facts, and, and it's great that you went back to the science and the endocannabinoid system, um, Kishan. Thank you for, for that. 
Um, but you do need to log on for more uh, and for more detailed things. There's a question coming in now about adverse effects and so on. Um, that w these will have to wait for the for the next one. Uh, let me tell you that um, Tuesday, October the 22nd, so a month from now at 7 p.m. again, um, Dr. Danny Gordon will be talking on medical cannabis and anxiety. Um, and uh, so please register for that. Uh, also, uh, it would be rude of me as um, chair of the uh, RCGP and SMMGP conference, along with, uh, with Kate and I chair that, um, 30th to the 31st of January 2020, need to mention. The details are on the SMMGP website and the RCGP, and by the way, you've got one month uh, left of an early bird um, discount there. Finally, I want to advertise my medic. Uh, if you put that into Google, you will find a fantastic uh, e-learning program to do at your leisure. There's uh, about six different uh, sort of courses on medical cannabis there, and you can get certification too. Uh, we'll give details of that in an email to follow. Finally, uh, please can I encourage you to fill out a brief evaluation that you'll get following the webinar. It does help us to shape these. Um, uh, that only leaves me to say uh, thank you to Kishan. Uh, you you have really have been fantastic and most interesting. Uh, thank you to the audience. You've been spectacular and come up with some, uh, some fascinating insights, comments and questions. Thank you. Um, good night. Thank you guys.